Okay, um, could I say, first of all, thank you very much for coming uh, tonight to this In Conversation event uh, with Maya Goodfellow, who is the author of a book that is released tomorrow, uh, Hostile Environment, How Immigrants Became Scapegoats. I've had a preview copy here, uh, and uh, I think it's available at the University Bookshop uh, and available, of course, at all good bookshops. Uh, what we're going to do... Um, for uh, the next hour is I'll have a chat with uh, Maya for about 20 minutes, half an hour or so, and then I'll open up to you uh, for questions uh, and answers. And then at around um, 7.30, uh, we'll close up and uh, you will get a chance, hopefully, if you want to um, buttonhole Maya afterwards uh, or just have a, a drink uh, and, and a nibble uh, to do so afterwards. So. Uh, I will uh, uh, start, and uh, I'd like to say, obviously, first of all, Maya, thank you for coming to talk about your book. It's a book I really enjoyed reading, um, partly because uh, it's actually something I do research on uh, myself, so I found a lot, actually, that I agreed with uh, in the book. Not least, I think, your argument that um, uh, the hostile environment that led to the Windrush scandal was far from an anomaly, in fact it's a continuation of what we've seen for decades um, in the debate about immigration in this country, and also your argument that by trying to appease anti-immigration feeling, um, politicians, and, and particularly progressive politicians, in, in somehow, somehow have legitimised anti-immigrant um, feeling and uh, have made it perhaps more respectable, but certainly uh, more salient and creating a, a vicious cycle if you like. Uh, and I also was particularly struck, I think, by the way that you talked uh, about the debate on immigration sometimes being framed as a debate almost between two tribes, the kind of metropolitan elite who supposedly love immigration and then the, the, the left behind white working class who supposedly hate it, and that being a very reductive way of, of, of talking about um, the, whole, the whole thing. Uh, and I thought the way also that you, you try to weave the voice of migrants themselves and the people who, who, who helped them into the book um, was, was, was very useful. You also have got loads, and I would recommend the book for, for all sorts of reasons, but this is one of loads of really good facts or factoids in there, um, um, some of which I, I didn't know and felt I should have known. I didn't know, for example, that the amount of the government bailout or compensation paid to British slave owners uh, for uh, their losses due to the abolition of slavery total £17 billion in today's money, uh, which was uh, quite a revelation um, to me. But I also enjoyed the book, I think, uh, because there's, there's stuff in there that um, lots of people, perhaps including me, might, might argue with, might disagree with. So uh, if you'll forgive me, I'll probably focus a little bit more on that because it will okay. make for a more <laughs> lively um, discussion. But before I, I start with kind of my caveats and, and, and my queries, I, I thought I'd just ask you uh, why uh, you wrote the book in the first place. Because you say it wasn't prompted by Brexit, but one of the points you make is that you can't really understand why immigration played such a big role in the referendum campaign um, you know, without understanding what's gone on in immigration for years and years and years. So, so why this book? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I didn't write, start writing it because of Brexit in the sense that I didn't write it because I was shocked necessarily what happened in that campaign. I thought what had happened in that campaign was awful. Um, I didn't necessarily predict that the UK would vote to leave the EU. Um, but this kind of, um, this idea that, that came to the fore from certain politicians, that Britain had become a place it had never been before with the referendum, so that it had become more hostile, it, it had become a place where people felt like they didn't belong. Whilst I think that's accurate, in like this, we don't want to ignore the very specific ways people mm -hmm. are being um, treated in the contemporary moment, we don't want to ignore the tenor of that campaign and what happened afterwards in the, in the sense of the rise in hate crimes, to say that it, 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 it turned Britain into a place it had never been before, I think I quote Andy Burnham as somebody who said this at the time, you know, that if we have a hard Brexit, Britain will become a place he wouldn't recognise. I think for me, when I was hearing that, 
I was hearing a real lack of understanding of British history because mm -hmm. if you look back at the debate, which is something that the book does, if you go through the, deba the immigration debate from the 60s onwards, if, if not before, but from the 60s onwards is really when there is immigration legislation um, introduced in Britain. There is some in the early 1900s, but it really, really picks up pace in terms of how it's centred in the debate in the 60s. If you understand that history, it's really not possible to say that Britain would become a hostile place. The hostility now might be slightly different, it might look different, it might feel different, the intensity of it might be different. But if you say that, if you say it becomes something different, you assume that it, there was never this hostility mm. ever in British history. And I think what you find from a lot of people who migrated here in that time, or people who were already living in Britain, particularly people who were not white, that is really a misreading of that history. So that was one of the reasons I wanted to write the book, not because of the referendum result, but rather the response to the referendum made me concerned that people maybe had an incorrect understanding of British history, which I think we can see anyway beyond Brexit. That's quite clear. And you know, we have some polling about people's understanding of colonialism, mm. for instance. Mm. I think we know that people's grasp of what Britain was and what it is, is, is not always, um, doesn't always tally up with the facts. But the other reason that I wanted to write the book and chose to write the book is because I used to work for a website called Labour List and I worked there in, during the 2015 general election and that, that website covers news and comment from across the Labour movement. And so I was following the election campaign when Ed Miliband was Labour leader. Now it seems like about a million years ago, but that campaign where La the Labour Party had those controls and immigration mugs. And I was really frustrated that there wasn't any kind of robust challenge to the arguments that were made about immigration, the anti, what I would call anti-immigration arguments. And there was an assumption, like one of, the, one of the reasons I really wanted to write the book is, although I think there is anti-immigration feeling in Britain, I wouldn't suggest it doesn't exist. Um, and I don't only think that it's created from above, but there is a suggestion in a lot of our political discourse that people's dislike of immigration is inevitable, that it's an inevitability. It's gonna always happen because of too much immigration of a certain kind. And I don't think that that's true. I think that they, it's not inevitable that people are going to dislike immigration. It's the political discourse, the historical discourse, the world in which we live in. We don't live in a vacuum, right? We live in a world in which people who migrate to Britain, at least certain groups of immigrants, are talked about in a particular way. And so I felt really frustrated that, that barely anyone in the public domain, it felt like, was arguing against the idea that dislike of immigration is somewhat something of an inevitability. And so that's, and I mean, the one final reason I did write it is because I thought there was nothing in the, there was nothing that was, um, there's loads of work on immigration that is really progressive, interesting, radical in a lot of ways that exists in academia, like loads, so much, so there's so much work I drew on, but from what, I mean, maybe someone in the audience will tell me differently, but from what I know is there isn't anything that is supposed to be really accessible to a wide audience. It's not that no academic texts are, but a lot of them aren't. Um, and so what I wanted to do was really try and make something that was a bit more journalistic in style, bringing in some of those arguments from, from academia into the public domain, because there are people doing that on the other side of the debate. Yeah. And um, to me, it felt quite important to try and have a, a counterweight to that. Okay, um, we'll get into some of that actually a little bit later. But you, you make a very good point about politicians telling us that people who are worried about immigration have legitimate concerns, as they often put it, even though those concerns are often based on misperceptions and misinformation and, and sometimes just plain prejudice. Um, but does that mean that those concerns aren't somehow genuine and, and therefore need responding to? I mean, how would you, how do you, as a politician, counter those concerns without simply dismissing them and, and telling people that they're wrong, which, which never really goes down very well, obviously. Yeah, I think so. This phrase, legitimate concerns, is something uh, that I've like, heard politicians use a lot. I mean, it's used actually a bit less now, I think. Um, but it, it, particularly in 2015, it was something that like Ed Miliband, David Cameron, all the all the main political leaders were saying, people have legitimate concerns about immigration. And my issue isn't that you don't listen to people's concerns or that you dismiss them. It's that that phrase and how, the, how that phrase was used, this idea that it's legitimate, it was, there was like a, an in, a, a, a unwillingness or a lack of desire of wanting to actually question whether they were legitimate in the sense of how they related to 
the world around us. And so there was an attempt really to not even try and grapple with, okay, this person is saying immigration drives down wages. What can we do about this view? Can we, can we change this person's mind by having a discussion with them? And I think one of the things that campaign, some campaigners say is that one mistake is when people are talking about immigration and they're saying negative things about it, is that you change the subject. That was a big thing in the 2015 election. It's something at the last election in 2017, Momentum had in their guidebook as well. It changed mm. the subject to something that is like better for the left, like the NHS. I don't think that's necessarily the right thing to do. Maybe in a general election campaign. I don't know, because we're in one now. Um, but I actually think that's not the right approach because people know you're doing that. People know you're kind of bobbing them off and trying to steer them in a different direction. And then you never really get to the conversation, okay, why is it? Why is it that you don't like immigration? And I think you can have that discussion without sa just saying, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. I think you can have that by drawing on your personal experience, asking them more questions about it. And you're not going to change everyone's mind. And you're definitely not going to change everyone's mind overnight. I think one of the things I thought a lot about when writing this book is how it is we've got here. And part of the reason it feels like we've got, we've got to this point where, the, well, we got to this point where it was generally accepted that immigration was a problem that needed to be dealt with, was that politicians wanted quick fixes or campaigners and people who worked on this issue wanted quick fixes of changing people's minds instantly. Unfortunately, <laughs> it sounds a bit depressing. I don't actually think that that's how it works. Some people, yes, I think you can bring them, bring them around or like, or change their mind or begin to get them to think about it in a different way. But what I think is that the, the views we have about immigration, even though they're not at the forefront of our public discussion now, and even though there's some, you know, there's polling to suggest people's minds are changing on this, um, I would still be wary about that because I think some of the ideas, the, the, the core ideas that people have about immigration, they build up over so long, like over decades, the discourse has been saying basically the same thing. And so I think to have a fundamental shift, like to fundamentally change how people understand immigration, I think that is gonna take, a, I think that's gonna take time to have it as a countrywide thing where we can have, you know, we can really grapple with it. It might sound a bit defeatist or a bit depressing, but I think that is the reality of it. You, you have to change minds by over a really long period of time. And like, for instance, one of the ways I think we do that is we, educate people it's like school age about certain things in British history is like a common thing to say but I think it's true that if you educate people about colon British colonialism what race even is right like what do we mean when we talk about this thing called race then that it, it, you equip them with the tools at least to understand things like immigration immigration in Britain and the debate in a different way it doesn't mean you automatically change minds but it means people have tools by which to understand this this thing in a different way um, and so, I mean, that's quite a long answer, but that's because I think it has to be multifaceted. I think yeah. there has to come from a number of different um, angles, and it, it just it, there isn't just like one cut your fingers and people's minds are going to be changed overnight. Okay. So there's no silver bullet there, right? Okay. Now, you, you quote Margaret Thatcher's infamous remarks from a TV interview in the 70s about people feeling rather swamped by people with an alien culture, um, which many people do when they write about immigration. Um, but uh, you don't, uh, in common with, with other people when they cite those remarks, also cite the, the, the next few lines, or the previous few lines, where she talks about numbers being very, very important. What, you, what we know from research is that there is a correlation between the numbers coming in uh, and concern about immigration, and particularly uh, if those numbers rise very rapidly in, mm. in places that you know, haven't had many immigrants before. But you say uh, uh, about numbers, uh, immigration figures have no meaning in and of themselves, but, but surely they do, don't they? Don't they just tell people that lots more people are arriving than are leaving? Uh, and then you cite a study showing that the most common adjective applied to immigration in the press was mass. And you say it's dehumanizing and stigmatizing and gives the impression that migrants are overwhelming the country. But uh, how else do we describe um, you know, what is a very large movement of people into the UK after 2005? I mean, language clearly is important, but don't you risk almost kind of denying something when you say, well, numbers don't really count or shouldn't count? I mean, I think it, 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 what we can look at is the history of this, right? So if you look back historically, it, the way particular groups who were coming into the country were marked out as problems, this didn't really correlate with numbers in mm. the sense of, in, so, in some way it did because you had people coming from the colonies and former colonies. Um, 
and this was seen to be in very large numbers. And if you look at that legislation that happened through the 60s, 70s and 80s, what you see is that was primarily directed at trying to keep out people of colour from coming to mm -hmm. Britain, right? It was not supposed to be white people coming from those colonies and former colonies. And so what I think that tells us is that whilst, yes, there is the, you know, it's not, it's not untrue to say that people look at the area around them and they think that it's changing and they think that these people, certain people coming in are a problem. I mean, I personally think that there is a way to address that. I think there's, again, it's born in a particular political context. And I think there is, when certain groups of immigrants are marked out as problems, this is where this be really begins to, um, to, to gather kind of pace in terms of how people feel. Mm -hmm. And I think what you can do, although I don't think it's only born of politicians saying particular things about immigration, right? I think people dislike difference, right? They, they, di they can dislike difference if they're told that difference is a problem or if they think that difference is a problem. But I think there's a way to combat that. I think there's a way to break that down mm -hmm. by having spaces where, you know, like having community spaces, for instance, where people do um, spend time with one another. If we look at the fact that areas where there are high, there, where there is high levels of immigration, people's concerns about immigration are not always so intense, right? Mm. And so what you have is when people know the people who are being talked about in these kind of, what I think are dehumanizing ways, um, then that doesn't totally rid those people of prejudice or rid them of racism. It doesn't cure them of, of, of these mm. things that are really widespread in society, but it does, it can go some way in terms of changing perceptions. And I guess the thing, I suppose, the thing about mass, the thing about mass, um, this term mass migration, the reason why I find it so, like, fine once upon a time, if you wanted to call it mass migration where there's lots of people moving into a country, then okay. But for me, it now has this meaning that is so negative, that is so charged, and, and to some degree, um, it, just, it does just strip away people of their humanity entirely, and I think a really good example of that is when we've talked about, in 2015, at the height of the so-called refugee crisis, the way that immigration and the way that people moving, I mean, still, this is still how it's talked about, was, was if it was like th these floods, swarms, like mass is now connected to these words in the political discourse, I think. And what is so damaging about that is I think it, it paves the way for policy that is so incredibly harmful. So things like closing down safe routes of passage, things like not having particular vi work visas available to people from particular countries. And mm -hmm. like, you know, we look at what happened in the past few weeks even with people being found dead in the back of a lorry. Mm -hmm. the, it, these things for me, they're not disconnected. The way we talk about immigration and the way it's legislated for, they are connected because it allows, you know, having, using this language allows politicians to kind of pave the way for this very restrictive policy. Um, and so whilst I understand that there is some relationship in, in some way between thinking about people coming into a country and how people feel, I don't think that's, an, I really don't think that's an inevitability. Mm. And I really don't think actually, it's something that Stuart Hall said, who, and I quote him mm. in the book, when he says, when you talk about numbers, it's always gonna be too much. Like, it's always going to be too much. And mm. so, yeah, you can make this argument that people feel uneasy because of too much immigration since 2005, but the, the, it can always be used in this way politically. And what I'm actually more interested in, because I feel like we spend a lot of time talking about individual people's views, and that does matter because you want to change people's minds, right? And p how people feel about things matters as well. But A, it's not only people... The only people who matter aren't just the people who dislike immigration. Mm. It's also the immigrants coming into this country. It's the people who are perceived to be immigrants, who are experiencing harassment, mm. abuse, um, who are feeling like they aren't welcome in Britain, who are, f or, you know, are being told to leave. Um, but I'm also really interested in the structural. I'm really interested in the broader like, political mm. debates about these things, mm. because we spend so much of our time talking, you know, we see, we've all seen the box pops, of people being asked on the street about their view about immigration. And I just think that, that there's a it's not that there's not a place for that, but that is so done to the point where we aren't really analyzing the broader, yeah. the broader political debate in which all of this is happening yeah. and just taking individual views as, a, like, a, yeah. as read for the rest of how the country feels about something yeah. or as the thing that we should listen to and therefore respond to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, don't get me started on rock spots. <laughs> anyway, but, uh, uh, right. Um, so I want to come back to something, actually, you, that, that kind of touches on what you just said, but also um, touches on something you said earlier. Um, you say in the book that dislike of immigration on the grounds of culture 
isn't a natural response, but is created by histories, political actions, and rhetoric. But, but why um, can't both be true? I mean, it, it's possible that anti-immigration feeling is based on lies, but couldn't it also be based, and in fact, you've, you've touched on this in your remarks, couldn't it also be based on a kind of hardwired suspicion of, of the other, of, uh, you know, wanting to protect the in-group against the out-group, of, you know, loss aversion, um, you know, things that psychological experiments show that a lot of us actually feel. Um, don't we have to take into account that rather depressing psychology if we want to change people's minds? Yeah, I mean, I think that, n no, I don't think it's necessarily an inevitability in the way that it looks, right? In the way that it's immigration that is the problem and certain groups of immigrants that are the problem. Mm. So you might want to say, okay, people are always going to have this kind of us and them. I don't know that that always has to be true, but, you know, I, don't, I, haven't, done the, I haven't done the work on that mm. um, to know how you would counter that. But it's who is the us and who is the them that is really one of the major problems for me because I think you can re-articulate that. And I think that this idea that it's hardwired to dislike certain groups, I don't think it's true. Maybe there's going to be this, this attention between the, the us and the them you talk about. But the, the problem for me is that when people are talking about so-called Ill illegal immigration, for instance, mm -hmm. they are not thinking about a white Australian who's overstayed their visa, right? The, this, this debate is racially charged, and it is racially charged, I mean, it's racist as well, so to, to, be, to be blunt about it. Um, the debate is racist in a lot of ways, the, how race functions shifts and changes as race often does. But my problem with it, because I think it's shaped by race, um, and because I think we can see that from the response to the Brexit referendum, you know, to, to who was told to go home after that, but we can also see it in um, some, like some bits of um, some slippages that sometimes happen in political discourse, and I, I cite this in the book, where politicians or documentary makers, and I don't know how widespread this is, but I've picked it up on a number of occasions, they, when they talk about immigration changing a particular area, the way they measure whether that change has happened or whether it's a problem, so they, the why they decide to go to, say, Slough, to look at if Slough has changed an area, is they look at the proportion of white people that lived in that area mm -hmm. 20 years ago and the proportion of white people that live in that area now. Mm -hmm. And if that is decreased, they're, they're like, we want to go and see what's happening with immigration in Britain. And that tells us two things. Is one is that the groups of immigrants that are marked out as a problem are often, um, they are often racialized but also that there's this, still this idea of white Britain and who is the real Britain is the white Britain. Um, and I think those function in the deba debate in very, very subtle ways. But to try and answer your question, and the reason why I'm talking about this is because for me, this us and them, the way it manifests in the contemporary moment, assumes that race is real, mm. <laughs> right? It doesn't understand the, the history of race. It doesn't understand that race is artificially constructed, that race is a product of racism, that racism is real, but race is not. And so without understanding those histories, the debate is going to look as it is. We're going to get policy that is racialized. We're going to get people, as I've said, being um, racially abused on the streets. And we're going to have this us and them take a particular mm -hmm. shape. Mm -hmm. And um, although I do think that's shifted in some ways because of when we think about people from Eastern Europe and how they may be racialized as not quite white, and it may change again with Brexit. Well, I, don't, I don't know what's going to happen. Depending on what happens there, there may be another shift again in terms of how race functions. But for me, I guess my primary concern is not solving this, solving this idea of us and them and how we, we manage that in the long term, but it is saying the inevitability of like disliking someone who moves next door because they came from India. And I mean, you hear this. I mean, I've heard this. I grew up with this. Mm -hmm. um, being told that you don't belong because of where you've come from and what your culture is, right? What your supposed culture is, as if it's a static thing. Mm. That is my concern. Mm. That is, I don't think that is inevitable, right? right? So maybe there's an us and a them fine that functions in, in, in society in a way, but how it looks, I don't, think, I don't think it has to look the way that it does. Okay. And, and on culture, um, I mean, you, you criticise concerns, particularly when they're voiced actually by Labour politicians like Tony Blair being the obvious example about the supposed failure of some um, immigrant groups uh, in society to, to integrate. Um, but is there absolutely no cause for concern uh, for people from the LGBTQ com community and, and for women um, about you know, the, the views on those issues held 
you know, in, in actually very large proportions in those immigrant groups. Um, is, is there no cause for concern? You, Which you, immigrant you, groups, sorry? Well, South Asian uh, groups, if you look, you know, if you do opinion polling and you look at, at attitudes uh, on women and you look at attitudes to, you know, homosexuality, for example, they are more culturally conservative, okay? Now, you answer that by saying, actually, there's a problem with misogyny and, and um, crimes against women in, in Western cultures, and you're absolutely right to say that. But won't you be accused by some critics then of sort of whataboutery, of, of denying that mm -hmm. there's a kind of problem in those... those no, because what I argue is th that those views should be seen as a, pa a manifestation of right. patriarchy in a very specific way. Right. So I'm not arguing against... I mean, I'm not arguing against that at all. I'm well aware of how, the, how the patriarchal views function in South Asian community. Mm. Um, but to say that it is a South, that South Asian thing, or to say that it is marked in one particular group, I think is a form of racism. Mm. And I think actually the way that we should see the violence that occurs against women across society, or the homophobia that exists across society, even though it may be more prevalent amongst certain people, I don't think we see that as a product of culture. I think, see that, I think we see that as a product of patriarchy and a product of homophobia. And I actually, the, the argument that I make in that section of the book is my problem is not my problem is not calling people out and saying and trying to change views and change the ways we talk about women or change the way we talk about LGBTQ plus people. Um, we should be doing that, but to suggest that it is one group that is marked out as particularly bad or, or it's, mm. it's embedded in their culture, that's how it's often talked about. Yeah. Like it's ingrained in the DNA of particular cultures, but it's never ingrained in the DNA of Western yeah. culture, yeah. whatever that may be. And yeah. um, that's my issue is that yeah. cultures are, are not static. And I think that is the case of whether you regard whatever cultural community, which I actually also think are not necessarily like um, bounded it's, things, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's certain traditions that exist, yes, um, but they also shift. Uh, my problem is the way that it's talked about is if people coming from certain parts of the world are going to import particular ideas to Britain, and therefore they're going to undermine a British way of life. And on what on firstly, I think that that British way of life is also changing. So. We have misogyny in Britain. We are, we've long had misogyny in Britain. Homosex, you know, laws against outlawing homosexuality were exported from Britain around the world, and that's yeah. not to say that mm. there weren't also already homophobic views in societies around mm. the world. But these two, these things are, are more complicated than just seeing it as Britain good and other parts of the world bad. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. also, it totally ignores the people who, in these supposed communities, who are arguing against these things, who are refusing to exit, like in all communities, right? Mm. And so I, fi I find it a very, um, I find it a very disingenuous argument in mm. terms of how it's articulated, but also how it sees Britain in mm. the contemporary moment. Yeah. And I think it's a very dangerous one that is used by the far right and that the mainstream have picked up and reproduced. And on Blair, I think it's, it's my, my problem is the integration discourse implies that there is something that you must conform to. This is a simulationist kind of Well, idea, it's, it's yeah. both a simulationist, but it's also, like, Blair has this really good, really good quote. I think I quote it. It's a really thing. It's really good. You know, he says something like, our tolerance is what makes us British, so either conform to it, to it or get out. And it's like, <laughs> there's a, you know, I might, like, he is one of many people who, say, who says this kind of thing. And so it becomes a very convenient way for politicians to imagine their own views and to mm. imagine Britain mm. and to mark out particular groups as a threat. And I think it's just far more complex than that discourse ever allows for. Mm. Um, and I think it's a, very, it's a very, very dangerous route to go down mm. because it is, is, is basically the new... This is an argument that was made by the new right in the 1980s, 1970s and 80s. And what it was, where this comes from, is... When re upon realizing that scientific racism was no longer something that would be acceptable in, to make their arguments, and I don't even know, actually, you know what, I don't even know if it was this calculated, but essentially, the, 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 new, the new right of e who, whom Enoch Powell was like, like, kind of in with, um, they would say, oh, no, no, we, it's not that we dislike someone because of their, their race, we, just, we don't think that they're inferior to us, they are just fundamentally culturally different from us. Right? And it's their culture that we can't handle. And so if we look back at that history, what I think that tells us about this debate about culture is it's been a very, very convenient way to repackage ideas about race because it's harder to argue against because there are, thing, there are things going on in terms of 
thinking about how patriarchy functions and homophobia that you've mentioned. Um, so it kind of blurs these blurs the, the lines a bit. Um, but it also just seems like it's it seems like it's not about race. It's mm. about culture. So mm. why are you telling us it's about race when we're talking about culture? Mm. We're just saying we want to preserve British culture from these groups that are culturally different from us. We don't hate them. We don't think we're better than them. They're just culturally different from us and they can't ever really get British culture. But certain groups can. If you're gonna come if you're white and you're gonna come from America, your culture's probably fine. Like there, there is yeah. a is is it's never explicitly it's not yeah. articulated like that. Yeah. It's usually not explicitly racially yeah. demarcated like that either. Yeah. Because it's very clever, it's very subtle, but I think it is still, still, still about race. Yeah. Okay. Getting, getting back to the politicians who, you know, I, I, I think I would agree with you, do so much damage by, um, you know, uh, trying to appease anti-immigration feeling and they end up legitimising it and making it more salient, uh, etc. I mean, do you think that most of them do it actually out of fear of the electorate? In other words, they, you know, many politicians, I think particularly on the right and in the centre of politics, tend to see public opinion as if you like, exogenous. So in other words, it exists outside what they can do about it and even perhaps what the media can do about it. Whereas on the left, there's a tendency to see things as endogenous and, and you know, you can do something about it. Um, but isn't it fear of the electorate, really, that drives what politicians do? It's not because they're malign people, necessarily. I mean, obviously, some, some people on the right particularly want to stoke racism, anti-immigrant feeling, but, you know, I'm not sure that's true, is it, of of politicians who regard themselves anyway as progressive, they're just scared, aren't they? Um, I mean, I think there's two things. One, I think I'm not. I'm kind of not really. I don't really see politicians as just like whether they're good or bad individuals. I'm not. Mm. I don't know, know that that's always helpful unless like they're really terrible. Like you know, they're doing some really terrible things. Um, I don't think that's actually that helpful a way to understand uh, what they're doing and what they're saying and the policies that they're advocating for or implementing. I actually think it's more interesting and important to look at their ideology. And so on the one hand, I think that there are politicians whose ideology just doesn't even grapple very well with race. Like if you look at some ideas of liberalism, there's like really a blind spot on this. It's this it, the way it's understood is very, is, for me, is not particularly nuanced. Mm. And it is doesn't really take into account British his, history in any kind of... Uh, in any kind of helpful or any kind of nuanced way that we need. And so, like, if you look at the new Labour administration, what you find is moments where there's a real, a real uh, unwillingness to fully grapple with what empire was, right? So you have mm. Brown going um, and making this statement about, you know, nothing to apologise for. And you have Blair kind of saying, oh, yeah, there's some good and some bad. And so there's a recognition that there's bad, but, you know, some of the empire was good. And so for me... That I, the way that ideology just doesn't even it doesn't even it doesn't understand these things in the way that I, I, I suppose I'm understanding them in the book. Um, but I think there is also a fear, right? So I think these th it can be both, and it, I think the best example of that is um, was Ed Miliband. Yeah. Actually, there's two good examples. One is Ed Miliband, and I interviewed a guy. I interviewed two people who worked for Ed Miliband um, when he was Labour leader, and. One of them said, you know, we, the white working class basically do, won't, don't trust us on this, so we need, to, we need to have a strong line on it. And so for me, that's kind of the ideological thing, right? Like, we need to have a strong line on this, this is who our base is, we can't be persuaded, which is kind of sort of what you're saying. But the other person I interviewed said, yeah, I mean, Ed didn't like, he didn't want to pander to UKIP, he didn't want to be UKIP light, but he thought that you couldn't change people's minds until you got in power and changed the economy, mm. which... Like, I kind of get it as an argument, but I think it also <laughs> assumes that all anti-immigration feeling flows from economic disenfranchisement, which some does, yeah, but, I mean, go and talk to some, like, really wealthy people in the south of London, mm. yeah, south of England who hate immigration, um, and I think you find it's more complex than that. And so the other example that I think is I instructive is, um, and I talk about it in the book, um, is there was a report published um, early on in the New Labour new labor period um, by the Runnymede Trust called The Future of Multi-Ethnic Britain. So Stuart Hall was also involved in that. Um, and basically this report kind of said there is this, there's this tie still between, it said lots of things, it's a really good report, I would encourage you to read it um, if you don't know it. Um, but it talks about basically the aim of the report was to, to think about how Britain could um, 
not become this really inward looking or not continue to be this very inward looking country and actually have some kind of ease with different people living alongside one another regardless of cultural background, regardless of what country you came from. And they have a line in the book where it says, and this is, so this was in 2000, I think, um, it says, you know, Britain is at a crossroads. We can choose the path of further insularity or we can try and basically find a different way of organising ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so now it kind of reads like they were prophetic because we have Brexit, we have all these, um, all these politics which, is, which can be seen to be inward looking in a lot of ways. Um, but what was interesting about it is the report said there is a link between Britishness and whiteness, right? It was said it in like the most, like if you read any Stuart Hall, it wasn't, it wasn't the kind of, it wasn't as, um, as kind of, plain and uh, like a b b searing analysis is what a lot of his work is, right? It is so clear and he doesn't hold any punches. This actually was said in the most subtle terms of like, there's some kind of link between Britishness and whiteness. There's still a tie between the two. It needs to be addressed, right? And the Jack Straw was supposed to be speaking at the um, launch of the report, had read the report, kind of said, okay, fine. And then the papers got hold of it, the right-wing papers, and there was front pages and saying, like, it's now racist to use the word Brit British or something. There was all this kind of um, hysteria over the saying that there is a link between Britishness and whiteness, which is just so painfully obvious. Um, but it was jumped upon, and Jack Straw just panicked. I mean, I haven't, I didn't interview him for the book, so I, I'm assuming he, it was a sense of panic, and said, then came out and said, like, yeah, the left is really dissing patriotism, they need to be more patriotic, mm -hmm. this isn't right. So he was, at, uh, beforehand, seemed to be kind of on board, and Omar Khan, who is now director of the Running Me Trust, um, has talked, I've heard him talk about this and said, like, you know, I was working there at the time, and he, he was all seemed to be on board with it, and then there was this kind of flip, and to me, that reads as, that read as fear of what the electorate is mm -hmm. going to think, fear of what the papers are going to say. I think that still comes along with ideology, but it is this panic of, like, there are these big discourses that have long existed in Britain about what Britain is. How do we even take it on? Mm -hmm. And I think there was never really a concrete plan. Like, okay. New Labour did some very good things when it first came in in terms of thinking about the Race Relations Act, in terms of human rights, but like the deeper conversation about what Britain is and, and, and I, th those kind of deeper ideas about whiteness, I think they didn't really grapple okay. with and didn't want to because they were too scared. Okay, so last question from me. Um, you say, so if there has to be an immigration system, legal aid must be brought back to support people through the process. That, and you'll call for a world where borders are not reinforced but opposed and dismantled, mm. um, rather suggest that you don't really think there should be an immigration system or you don't think there should be borders. Is that the case? Yeah, I mean, I don't. I think I, think it, I find it very difficult to defend. I, I have to be honest, I find it difficult to defend, but I know that that is the wor world that we live in. So I'm not, I'm not thinking that um, the next government, whoever that might be, is going to get rid of the UK's immigration system and get rid of the border regime. I think you can make it a lot less violent. I don't think you can have non-violent borders because they're going to be... Or you can't have non-exclusionary borders, right? Someone is going to be... There's going to be some system by which you say some people are allowed in, some people aren't. The people who don't and who come in, you're going to deport them. I think that is, that is how an immigration system is going to function. I don't think it has to function in the way that it is functioning, though. I don't mm. think you have to make it so that people can't access legal representation. People are put in detention centres for like not told them like no, not told what is happening to them. I think there is another way of organising it that is much, much, um, much less exclusionary and much less violent in the way that it does function. My, I, but I can't sit here and say that is the perfect world for me, and that's the world that I wish that you know I, I only aspire to. That's I think you have to. You can also have a horizon. But mm. I just know that we're not going to get to that horizon <laughs> probably while I'm alive, if ever. And so I think it's important still to talk about what borders are, to talk about why we might want to dismantle them, to talk about why a world without borders might be a good thing and how that would even function. Mm. I don't think that, you know, I'm not, I don't have all those answers and I'm not expecting that to happen um, tomorrow. But I think it's important that you do talk about it because if you don't, then, I mean, why not? Yeah. My, like, my question is really why, why wouldn't we at least discuss that and think about what that it would be as a, as a political reality, I don't know, 100 years from now, 50 years from now? Why wouldn't we even have that in our imaginations if it's something that we care about and something we believe in? Mm. I'm sure if you really love borders, there's a reason you wouldn't want that. But for the rest of us who really think that borders are a problem, who th think that bo 
processes of bordering are bad for people who are trying to cross borders, and bad for people who are racialized as a threat, bad for people who are not super rich. Um, I think it's I think it's a good thing to still to still talk about and to think about. And I mean, although of course you know there are problems with the European Union's external borders, if you talked to people in the 1950s and said there'll be no border between France and Germany, there'll be no border between yeah. France and Italy, or, you know, people would have said you're nuts to do that, and yet, you know, here we are, or in the case of Britain, there we were. Um, <laughs> so, uh, any questions? Okay, I'll take one there, uh, one there, and one there, and then I'll come back to you, sir. Okay, so yes, go ahead. Um, hi. Uh, so, uh, oh, can we just wait for the microphones? I'm so sorry, I should have said that. There, uh, yep, yeah, okay. So we've got two microphones, so one will find you. Okay. Uh, so whenever there is a conversation about uh, immigration and racism, I've noticed that there is a great degree of defensiveness because many people, um, you know, many white people, they don't like being called out, you know, they don't like being told what to do, they don't like being called racist, you know, because they're like, I'm not racist, you know, uh, I just, you know, have a problem with immigration and they don't don't consider them, and they don't kind of accept this language that we, you know, you're using right now. So, how can we actually build this dialogue on this national level um, if it seems like we don't even share a common language? Okay, great question. And then if you could pass the mic to to that lady, yeah, thank you. Um, hi there. So I'm from Eastern Europe. I graduated from Queen Mary Pride last year, basically. Um, I work in hospitality and I do engage with customers and most of them that where are you from? I'm from Romania. It's like, oh, so um, are you going back? Are you staying? Oh, I've been to Bucharest recently, for example. That's, um, and then my, there were men uh, were like whistling me, trying to hit on me. And then I looked at her and I said, I, do, I get this in London as well. And I feel a bit uncomfortable with the conversation. I was like, I'm Eastern European, this happens in Bucharest, but there's two million People in Bucharest and London, there's about 20. And here you get a lot more cases of rapes and murders and knife crimes and then whereas in Bucharest, I'm, I'm much more safer, to be honest. And this is why I, I tell guests. I tell guests whenever they come in. But then they wouldn't have this conversation because I'm responding with something they weren't expecting. They'd be like, oh, I'll have to go back. Or I can't, they were expecting a broken English maybe. They'd be like, oh, hi, I actually have a master's degree. And I do enjoy talking about immigration. And I do want to know how you want to approach this, like people, like everyday people come in a restaurant or anywhere and be like, oh, I want to have this conversation about immigration. I want to I wanna be with you and I want to explain to you that there's basically no such thing as, you know, putting us on a boat and coming here as refugees and having to be. Right, okay, thank you. And then uh, Carl. Okay, I mean, I, I, I could add to that actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think you're, you know, you, you make very legitimate criticisms of Ed Miliband and, and Blair and Brown, but you know, maybe some people would say you're a bit mild in your criticism of Jeremy Corbyn, given that he opposes free movement, mm. and therefore you could say he's the most anti-immigration mm. Labour politician we've seen since Jim Callaghan. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, so, Maya. Um, okay. Um, uh, I guess these, these two questions kind of doesn't overlap between mm. them. So this idea like when we don't have a common language and then how do we also have these conversations with people? Um, I mean, I guess it also depends. What I'd be interested to know is for you, if you're having those conversations, what's worked? Like, have you found things that where you've talked to people and you've begun to change their minds? Like, what is it that you've been saying to them and what have their... Right? I'm not just here to tell you 
I don't have all the answers. I'm not here to just tell people how to have those discussions. But I think um, this idea of not having a common language, I think it's how we, how we have the discussion, right? And so what I'm interested in is that it's kind of been the common refrain is, oh, it's not racist to have concerns about immigration has been like the thing that's been said by politicians for quite a while. Um, and if you try and talk about race, there is an assumption, and some people do want to do this, but not everyone who talks about race wants to do this. There's an assumption that all you want to do is call someone a racist and then just like, mm. that's it, end of conversation, you're, you're a racist, you hate immigration, discussion over. Um, what I think is actually more interesting is to try and locate where race is in the debate and how it's operating and then what we do about that. So for me, I think to even have, to get to this point where we can even talk about this, um, there just needs to be a public discourse on racism. And I think that is a really difficult thing to achieve. But as, as long as it's polarised in the way that it is, of like always debating whether someone, something someone said is racist, it's like, I mean, there's some usefulness to that at some points in time. But what's more interesting, actually, is to think about the impact of policy, to think about the way that race is like structured in our society. And so to have that common language, like I said, I think it is a case of education and it is a case of how we instill this in our education system. And I guess it is also about saying, my aim is not to just call someone a racist. My aim is to say, okay, why is it that you think like this in this particular way about this particular group of people? And what has led you to, th to this point where you think this? And where, like, what in your life is happening that you really have this view about X group and think that they are all whatever you think they are. And I think what is often, I was at a, uh, an event quite a while ago and the, the, and we were talk, and the discussion was about, was about exactly this. It was about um, people voting for particular political parties. And one of the people on stage said, you know, um, if I, uh, people who are racists are just racist and they're write-offs and that's it. And you just don't even deal with them. And it's like, where's the line between being a racist and not being a racist? Because, yeah, a lot of people individually don't want to be called a, called a racist, but we live in a society that is institutionally racist, and I think people have racist views and they don't, even, they don't want to call themselves a racist or reflect on that. And so having this really hard line between, yeah, yeah, there are people who are on the far right and they're, they're the people you're never going to persuade, you don't want to, what's the point? But for a lot of other people, it's like, don't you want to address that prejudice. Like, don't you want to change society? Don't you want to change the way that they're thinking? And I think you don't only change that by having discussions with them. You change it by doing a lot of different things in terms of what the public discourse is. Um, and so I guess, yeah, when you're having those discussions, like all you can really do is talk about your own experiences, right? Or talk about the people you know and try to make it more human for people. Because what is one of the most surprising things of the past few years is when I was in the middle of writing this book, the Windrush scandal happened. And there's something that Gary Young, uh, the Guardian journalist says, is that the government just didn't think that people would care about black Britons. They just didn't think they would care about these people being deported and being treated this way. They were warned. They were warned like years before that, that there was a potential that this was going to happen. And he says, you know, they just took a gamble and bet that the British public wouldn't care. And whilst I think we don't want to ignore all the subtle ways that racism is operating in Britain and suggest that because people cared about Windrush, then everything's fine. But what that does tell us is people do, people's minds can be changed, people can have sympathy for the people they don't know. Um, and that should give us some kind of hope. Windrush actually still, even though um, it was now over a year ago, I think that still shows us that it's possible to change the debate and it's possible to change how we talk about immigration. It just needs the really concerted effort to push it a bit further. Um, and on Labour and Corbyn, yeah, I mean, I am critical of, um, I am critical of uh, Labour's 2017 manifesto, and I don't think it's right to have had no recourse to public funds. I don't think it's right to say they would end freedom of movement. I do think there is a difference in that, I think that part of it is fear. So actually, how I see it is part of it is fear of the electorate and fear of who they want to win in terms of votes. Part of it is a strand of the left that just doesn't really care that about internationalism, is actually more concerned with a socialism that is within one nation. Um, and so I think it's both things rubbing up alongside one another. But what I think, the, way, the, re, the place there's hope, and this happened after I finished, like after this went to... Um, 
<laughs> to be printed, uh, is a Labour Party conference. Activists organised. They organised and put forward a motion with one like some of the most radical, what would make some of the most radical immigration policy in British history. I don't think that will all be adopted in the next manifesto. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm happy to be proven wrong. I'm not <laughs> sure that it will be, but we'll wait and see. Yeah. Um, but what is good is that the point about the point part of the point about what Corbyn is supposed to be doing with Labour or what Corbyn's Labour is supposed to be is not only the shifts in policy on things like the economy, it is changing how the Labour Party functions. It's supposed to be about giving members more of a say. I don't think that's actually happened in, in certain ways. Um, but if it's gonna, there's going to be this kind of member-led thing or there's going to be this kind of pressure from below, what gives me hope is that activists organised at the last Labour Party conference and they organised around a motion about ending, um, closing down all detention centres, recommitting to free movement and extending free movement um, and th things like no recourse to public funds. They said, we do not agree with this policy and there's been a lot of discontent around that. And so, you know, our politics isn't only about politicians saying and doing things. I mean, ultimately, as I've just said, in a general election, they are going to wield a lot of power because they're going to make a decision about what goes in the manifesto, that Clause 5 meeting. But Politics is also about people getting engaged and doing things in their local communities and pushing p p politicians to do things differently. And so what is hopeful to me is that there are people organising outside the Labour Party as well as within it around this mm -hmm. issue, around immigration, to try and push for um, change in our immigration policy as well as how we understand um, immigration. So, yeah, it, 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 there's still a long way to go. Um, and, I mean, I guess we'll wait and see what is in that, that manifesto. I, mm -hmm. Hope no recourse to public funds, at least, will no longer be in there. But your guess at this stage is really as good as mine. OK, let's take a uh, further round of questions. OK, so uh, young lady here, gentleman there. Well, and we've got three. So we've got uh, two there. Oh, actually, the gentleman will take four. Because, it. yeah, no, uh, young lady here, that's fine. Then the, the guy next to her, then the guy at the back, and then the guy in the middle. All right? <laughs> OK, so um, I've been I'm a teacher, a primary school teacher, and I've been studying fundamental British values um, in schools, and I'm very interested in how, you know, I think a big part of our solution to everything is, well, let's educate mm. about it. Um, and I'm thinking, at the moment, there is, I, I really want there to be space for this, for this kind of talk, but there isn't because of accountability measures and because of, you know, the amount of pressure teachers are under and the curriculum and whatever. So I was wondering whether you have any thoughts on how we would go about it. You know, setting, you know, this agenda within schools and whether, I don't know, whether you've thought about schools in general. And, yeah, okay, great question. And then... Okay, so according to a lot of the sort of black radical uh, literature, like under the Carolingian dynasty in Europe, the language of barbarianism sort of causes racial formations and that's the justification of slave labor. And a lot of the sort of anti-immigration rhetoric is, as you say, a, a sort of a, pro a process of racial formations <laughs> that in our day today is leading to precarious work, experimental security, expansion of surveillance, uh, political expediency, um, but it's also a language of peripheralization, right? So like we see like the sort of dichotomy of refugees as either entrepreneurs or as sort of non-agentic mm. benefit scoungers. Mm. And how do people you interview, particularly asylum seekers, uh, identify, self-identify in opposition to sort of this dichotomy? Mm. Okay, great question. And then uh, the... the Long-awaited question from the guy at the back. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, it's actually about Tony Blair, so I've no idea. <laughs> that's okay. good um, there seems to be a contradiction in the new Labour years, I've always thought, between what you rightly described on Truth or in the book about the tough rhetoric and even tougher policy in some areas, but also the fact this was the government which very quickly liberalised and yeah. deliberately, I think, brought about much more generous visa access, mm. this sort of thing. Um, and ultimately, the A10 accession um, that opened up uh, borders very quickly uh, to other European countries. So I'd just be interested in your thoughts on how those two things mix together, this kind of toughness that came along very soon after that, but mm. that initial instinct, which seemed very pro-migration, yeah. and in many ways very positive. Okay, and finally, Jen, in the middle. Yeah, it should be on. <laughs> yes, um, I read this leaflet, and in it there's this statement, uh, nor putting a strain on public services. And uh, I'm a Roman Catholic, and a similar uh, line appeared in the uh, M 
AC report on e EA migration. Mm. And I read it out to a, another Catholic friend of mine, and he just burst out laughing because Catholic schools have been overwhelmed with uh, the Polish in influx or mass immigration, whatever I'm supposed to call it. And uh, the reason I bring that up, apart from because he basically wrote it, is when Tim was talking about uh, homophobia and you didn't mention events in Birmingham recently, uh, I'm just amazed how you managed to answer his question without mentioning religion. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, right. Okay. Schools. Uh, I. My partner is also a primary school teacher and is teaching about British values as well. Um, and it's. Yeah. It's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of that. But I think um, I don't have uh, the answers on this. But where does is the Running Me Trust, I don't know if you've seen it, has produced our migration story, which is a really good tool, I think. And so until, as I see it, I mean, it's not, it's a very imperfect answer, but I do think we probably do need a change in government in order to have a change in curriculum. But our migration story, um, that resource, I think provides a really good way of knitting in bits of thinking about immigration history and racial history in Britain into... Um, into into like the lessons that you're teaching and I know what they try are trying to do at his school is like they're like we don't just want to have a black history month how can we actually knit in this into our the way that we're teaching our histories and the way that we're also teaching other parts of our curriculum um which is a kind of imperfect solution but you know trying to navigate a system that is not designed to where to teach these things, right? It's not designed, the way that our curriculum is designed isn't for this to be done. Um, to actually use some of those resources to pick it in and just knit it into lessons. Um, but I have a lot of conversations with teachers asking the same thing and I think it's really difficult to do, but I do think it's worth trying to find a way to bring in just that into like your lessons as much as you can where it allows for it. Um, and the question about uh, ref this di dichotomous phr phrasing of refugees, entrepreneurs versus scroungers, a lot of people I talk to are really angry. Like they're, they're really, I think a lot of people actually were just angry that they were made out to be scroungers when they're working so hard. So not people who are asylum mm. seekers, right? Because they can't, you can't work if you're seeking asylum. Most people can't work. But people who are refugees and migrants are just furious that there is this discourse that says they don't contribute. And I don't think that is like a good end point because there are going to be people who don't, aren't seen to contribute in the right way. And you don't want to, um, you don't want to, kind of marginalise them, but there's a really legitimate thing there of a, of a lot of people I spoke to saying, you know, all we see in the news is that we are overwhelming services and that we are doing these things to this country, and all we're doing is working so hard. There was one guy I spoke to who was like, I moved here because there was no opportunity at home, I couldn't get a job, and after the 2008 crash, the fam our family business totally collapsed. And I came here, and now I work three jobs, and I don't get any days off. And to, if I want to see any of my friends, they live the other side of London. So I have, I, like, I have to spend hours trying to get to them and have some social time, which is really hard to carve out because of the amount I'm working. And so I think a lot of people feel just really angry that the way they're being spoken about is so counter to what their everyday experience is. And yeah, that, that's, that's all I picked up from almost everyone I talked to was this just sense of like, who are they, you know, who are they talking about because it's not me. And it, they really wanted to prove that that wasn't them. And, um, and I think that, that, that that's an important recognition in the debate where for so long they've be, people have been talked about as a drain. Um, and on New Labour, uh, yeah, there is. An, it's really interesting because there was a liberalisation, what is called a liberalisation. Definitely, there was an uh, effort to change the immigration system and to make it easier for certain people to come in. Um, there's two things about that, though. At the same time as doing that, there was a really, um, there was a really tough discourse on asylum, and so almost from the get-go, there was a really, really, uh, there's a, there was a hostility towards people who were seeking asylum and the way that they were being talked about, but also the legislation that was introduced, like things like not allowing people to work whilst they were waiting on their um, asylum forms to be processed. And I think that that, I think that that kind of poisons the whole debate, not in its entirety, because it, it is true that at times that New Labour were saying immigration is good for the economy. Like that, was a, that was a big message in the 2000s under Barbara Roach. 
they were saying that, but it sits uncom really uncomfortably alongside this other discourse. And so th for me, they kind of get, they, they get confused with one another in the public debate. Um, but I also think there was a kind of, whilst there was this attempt to change the debate in a way that there really hadn't been for, for um, a long time, maybe not change the debate, that there was a, a different discourse about what immigration potentially being economically good. I, that came alongside as well, eventually came alongside, like, but we're going to keep out the wrong people. Don't worry, we're going to be really tough and, like, deport people and have immigration raids. And so, it, again, I just think that that didn't, there wasn't really that much of a, a, enough of an effort to shift that what was a really long, deeply held, deeply held ideas in the British public. Um, and then propping up some, like, kind of racialized framing about immigration and asylum. And unfortunately, what you do find is that, like, as it gains ground, they do begin to just kind of give way, like, some of the discourse gives way. Like, by the time you get to Gordon Brown, you do have, like, British jobs, British workers kind of language. Um, and so there is a contradiction. I think there is. I think it is just a contradiction that sits there. But I think it was, unfortunately, a lot of the anti, like those anti-immigration, anti-asylum um, ideas were still just there percolating and still being articulated by those politicians mm -hmm. who were also saying immigration is good for the economy. And so like you just, it, it didn't really work as a kind of reframing of the debate in the way that maybe it could have. Um, and on public services, yeah, I mean, Jonathan Portis, the economist who I interviewed for the book, has written and done a lot on this. And what he says is that uh, what he says is that where you can plan, you just need better planning. You can plan for people coming into the country. A lot, of, a lot of people who come into the country don't immediately use services. People don't always come with children, and they don't often don't immediately need to use things like the health service. And so you just need better planning and better investment in order to ensure that everyone is accommodated for in the right way, just like you do with any other kind of population change. And this is something Diane Abbott said maybe like a year and a half ago, is that, you know, immigration should be treated like other population changes that you can plan for, right? It shouldn't be deep, like marked out as this bit massive problem. You just, you just plan for these things and then, then you're good. And have you done so? And have we done so? No, there hasn't been, there hasn't been proper investment. Well, are you surprised that people call the vote for a change? Is there a new referendum? Well, the, but my point is, is I don't think immigration is the causal issue there. Okay. Well, we'll, uh, we'll have to leave that till uh, the discussion over the wine and other drinks are available uh, and nibbles. Uh, so I'd just like to say thank you to all of you for some great questions. Thank you, obviously, most of all to oh. Maya as well. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Uh, just uh, just uh, uh, to remind you that the book is out, I think, tomorrow. So it's Hostile Environment, You Immigrants, uh, How Immigrants, Sorry, Become Scapegoats. Just before we um, get on to the drinks and nibbles, just to remind you that we have got some other events coming up. We've got one uh, next week on Monday the 11th on data rights, citizens or subjects. So uh, what are your rights over your own data and uh, how much of our lives are being, as it were, stolen uh, by <laughs> the, the companies that keep uh, our, our data. Then we've got one on Monday the 18th, uh, what is Corbynomics? the new political mm. economy of the British left, obviously very relevant if you're thinking of uh, voting Labour uh, during uh, the next election. And then we have on Thursday, the 5th of December, before the election, uh, Adrift, Britain's global role beyond Brexit. And what we're looking at there is, you know, is there any such thing anymore as the national interest? And if there is, how should it be best promoted? So thanks once again and do please enjoy your hospitality.